Welcome, everybody, to this is the last of our um, conference series on surveillance in law and the humanities. And um, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who's been involved in the preparation, particularly Professor Anne Poulon Ernst and Claire Robel, um, who have been, and Yelena Grigorovich uh, from the ANU, but uh, Anne and Claire from Paris 2, who have been uh, convening this series. And I've been largely a kind of, um, I don't quite know what the word is, a kind of a moral support perhaps more than anything else for, for their really amazing efforts to, to pull this program together. Uh, and it's been really a um, delight to participate and listen, listen to and I'm ex particularly delighted to welcome today's um, closing speaker um, from Paris Sorbonne. Um, so I'll just say that uh, we're expecting, uh, we've only got one speaker today. Uh, so uh, Professor Tadier is going to be talking for, we think about 40 minutes and then we'll have uh, about 20 minutes or so for questions. If you do have questions, um, you can uh, send me something on the uh, Q&A or on the chat line um, um, and we'll raise your hands and I'll ask Anne to sort of keep an eye on that um, in case in case things I miss things in, in that process. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Desmond Manderson and I'm uh, Director of the Centre for Law, Arts and Humanities uh, at the ANU, and we've been very uh, privileged and delighted to have uh, Professor Bruno Ernst here as a long-term visiting fellow for the last year or two, and it's out of that collaboration that this series has been developed, and with the support, the generous support of an AFRAN grant uh, that turned out to be extremely generous given COVID meant we've had nothing to spend our money on. But um, it's the thought that counts, and the thought was absolutely fabulous. So thank you, a very special thank you to AFRAN for their for their, for their support um, and assistance in making this program possible. And a thank you to um, our today's speaker, um, Professor Tadier, uh, uh, who's uh, at uh, Paris Sorbonne, where he's Professor of English Literature, uh, and also an honorary research fellow at the Institut d'Université de, de France. Uh, and uh, Professor Tadier has done really wonderful, rich, and um, uh, really fascinating work across a range of uh, genres uh, and literatures, specifically, specifically looking on literature as it encounters um, the alien fields of philosophy, I guess, and the alien uh, worlds uh, of the East. And it's about those encounters with difference, I think, that Professor Tadier has been most uh, interested uh, in. Um, and he's uh, going to be talking today about um, uh, surveillance, utopia, and satire in 18th century literature. Now, I think earlier on today we asked, um, we sent around uh, a handout that Pro Professor Tadier has prepared in advance of this talk so that we can see the quotes that he's going to be talking about. For those of you who haven't yet, um, uh, haven't downloaded or don't have that handout to hand, you can accident access it through the website of the Surveillance Conference. Um, and I've just put up a link. I believe that link ought to take you straight to the handout. So you should be able to just click on that and uh, download the PDF from there. If you're finding that problem, if you're finding that that link doesn't work for you, just send me a chat and I'll put up a link to the surveillance site instead. So without further ado, uh, let me hand over to Professor Tadier for today's Closing lecture on utopia and satire and surveillance in 18th century English literature. Thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction. And I would like to start first by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, address this um, virtual gathering. It's a first for me, first because I've never been to Australia. So I'm quite excited about this. And secondly, because I've never actually given a proper lecture on Zoom. And my first worry was, um, because that's how you, one usually starts a lecture, is how do you make a joke on Zoom? Because you can't hear people, yeah. uh, even remotely smiling. How do you interact on, in the new normal? How do you even get on Zoom if, like me, you stick bits of post-it onto your computer camera and prevent apps from accessing the microphone? But I would like to take the opportunity to thank the IT services of ANU for explaining how to do all this, including removal of said post-it. I would like also to apologise for not being exactly a specialist of surveillance, but it was for me a fascinating way to revisit a corpus uh, from a different angle. 
But not being a specialist may mean that uh, the theoretical underpinnings of my argument may appear a little slight, and I wish to apologize for that. But also, uh, because it makes 40 minutes of Zoom perhaps slightly more palatable, I've chosen to tell you stories. And I will start with one small one. In book four of Gulliver's Travels, and this is a quote uh, you have, I think, on your handout. In book four of Gulliver's Travels, Gulliver finds himself among the wise horses, the Huinins, and is taken by their rational approach to life, adopting their mode of life as much as, shall we say, humanly possible. In doing this, he separates himself willingly from human beings and becomes enslaved to the wise horses. Quote, I had not yet been a year in this country before I contracted such a love and veneration for the inhabitants that I entered on a firm resolution never to return to humankind, but to pass the rest of my life among these admirable twinnings in the contemplation and practice of every virtue, where I could have no example or incitement to vice. Gulliver submits himself to the rule of the Huynians, who, after all, as we know, execrate Yahoo's like himself and dream of exterminating them. Gulliver's predicament is perhaps not unlike ours, when we submit ourselves to forces which aim at taking control of our lives. And perhaps, like Gulliver, we approve of these forces and exert our choice in submitting ourselves willingly to a paradigm which controls us. This is perhaps reminiscent of Bernard Harcourt's thesis about contemporary forms of surveillance, where we willingly deliver ourselves to the surveillance technology, to control exert exerted by powers which we do not influence. Like Gulliver, perhaps, we are submitted and exposed to surveillance through our passions. Swift's argument is, of course, slightly more subtle, because by portraying Gulliver as his own victim, he implies ironical distance. But the joke is also on us, because, like Gulliver, we're willing to surrender ourselves in the name of rationality to an order advocated and implemented by the Huynins. Beyond the predicament that we face when dealing with surveillance, this small example shows the complex position in which satire can place us. We may find a certain pleasure, which does not preclude horror, of course, and a host of other emotions. We may find a certain pleasure in the satirical take on surveillance, but this pleasure is sometimes cancelled or enhanced, depending on how you feel about these things, when we realize that, as readers or spectators, we are also part of the setup. This, in turn, suggests, I think, the importance of satire, a genre, a genre which has been with us since antiquity. Because satire both makes us aware of the pitfalls of certain passions or organ organizational modes, and at the same time sometimes includes us among its targets and therefore victims. In this sense, the relationship between satire and surveillance, which I indicated as one possible aspect of my talk today, this relationship is not only based on the distance which we may experience in witness, witnessing in literature the effects of surveillance, but on the fact that the satire of surveillance may act as a possible corrective to our enthusiasm for such operations. Surveillance, as we know, operates both in space and in time. In space, our cities are peppered with video cameras which record our every move. Our Apple watches connect us to satellites which signal our position thanks to a relatively precise global positioning system, etc. In time as well. In the past, of course, unless you wish to turn it off, Google records all of your past searches and keeps them forever until you delete them. In the present, certainly, as I'm talking to you, I'm aware that being connected to the internet implies the possibility that someone not registered is listening. And in the future, mainly, this is of course the brilliant point of surveillance, the prediction of our moves, not to say of our clicks of the mouse. And as we know, this is what is traded in this, our age of surveillance capitalism. The future is therefore critical to our understanding of surveillance. And this is why in this talk, I've chosen to evoke utopia, a genre which entertains intimate links with the future as well as with the depiction of the possible better, if not ideal, state of things. This talk will therefore concentrate on the modes of surveillance as perceived through utopia and through the satirical take on utopia. I will try to chart a brief course through early modern literature as the age in which reflections on the nature of surveillance began to surface, and this in a century which closed on Benton's panopticon. I will start by reminding us of one of the most celebrated worlds where science and surveillance seem to walk hand in hand, that of Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, 
And we then move on to the ambiguities of Ethiopia, to the island where Robertson Crusoe finds himself stranded for a number of years. Although, of course, not directly in Ethiopia, utopian aspirations may transpire, but corrected by the language of surveillance. And we then turn to the satire of Ethiopia, enacted first by Swift, who at least in book three of Douglas Travels seemed to be responding to Bacon's House of Solomon, and then, if we still have time, by Pope, who would guide us perhaps to resistance to the world of surveillance as we keep on creating. Bacon's posthumously published narrative has often been regarded as a blueprint for a science academy, as an ideal state of affairs where the progress of science will be organized along rational lines. The proposed scheme combines observation through the senses and interpretation of experiments, thanks to the hierarchical collaboration of scientists. This scheme purposes to embody the advancement of learning at the beginning of the 17th century and looks forward to a future based on science and knowledge. Bacon's text is roughly divided into two parts. The first part narrates the arrival on the island of Van Salen of a group of 51 travelers on board a stray ship. They're welcomed by the inhabitants who look after them and tell them a little bit about the island. They're conducted to the stranger's house where they enter into conversation about the history of the island with one of the local dignitaries. The second and shorter part of New Atlantis describes the organization of the local academy of knowledge called Solomon's House. While the island of Ben Salem and the scientific institution at its center are built on the scientists' and natural philosophers' observations and deductions of the true nature of things, they also depend on secrecy, which the text suggests at every turn. As soon as they arrive, the travelers are, for instance, submitted to the laws of secrecy, which are enforced for foreigners, like a well-protected and equally interdisciplinary Los Alamos, the island is shrouded in secrecy. The strange thing about the island, of course, is the imbalance in its relationship to the world, which means that the island is, quote unquote, unknown to the rest of the world, while they know well most part of the habitable world. Against what the text calls the interknowledge between nations of the world, which ought to be the norm, the island of Bensalem is hidden from view while having access to the rest of the world. Secrecy, finally, is reiterated by the most important interlocutor of the travelers, the father of the House of Solomon. All experimenters have to take an oath of secrecy until decisions have been made as to which experiments should be advertised and which should not. This implies a system of surveillance. Indeed, the curious configuration of the island both on the margins of the world and at the center of things, rests on two principles. First, the Ben Salamites rely on what we would call an extreme form of protectionism. 900 years ago, and I think you've got this quote, their king did ordain the interdicts and prohibitions which we have touching entrance of strangers, which at that time was frequent, doubting novelties and commixture of manners. Forbidden interactions with foreigners, to which changes in maritime routes must be added, means that the Ben Salamites have remained, one hesitates to say pure, but certainly independent and out of sight. Unreachable. This protectionism goes hand in hand with, secondly, forms of spying, which guarantees access to the rest of the world. Every 12 years, they should be set forth out of this kingdom, and I'm reading from, a, from another quote, every 12 years, they should be set forth out of this kingdom, two ships appointed to several voyages that in either of these ships there should be a mission of three of the fellows of brethren of Solomon's house, whose errand was only to give us knowledge of the affairs and state of those countries to which they were designed, and especially the sciences, arts, manufactures, and inventions of all the world, and with all to bring unto us books, instruments, and patterns of every kind. And here we remind, of course, that Francis Bacon comes from the land of Brexit. This is a post-Brexit world which he describes. Beyond secrecy, the Ben Salamites do not hesitate to have recourse to confinement. Having installed themselves in the house of strangers, the travelers are asked not to think themselves restrained, in spite of the fact that they have to keep within doors for three days, thereby introducing a form of quarantine, while the attendants have an eye upon them. From the beginning, the narrative is placed under the sign of seclusion, which is not described as a form of imprisonment, but this is the ambivalence of all the forms of seclusion, as we know. Do not think yourselves restrained, says one of the characters, 
but rather left to your rest and ease. But it also uses literally the language of surveillance, as the narrator recounts, they have an eye upon us, quote unquote. This is further exemplified by the speech of the governor of the house, who comes to explain, the state has given you license to stay on land for the space of six weeks. This is both presented as a convenience, and he mean the visitors may enjoy the hospitality for longer should it be needed, but also as a restraint. And in this, I must tell you that none of you must go above a carry, that is with them a mile and a half, from the walls of the city without a special leave. And here we reminded that during lockdown in France, we were not allowed to venture further than one kilometer from our houses. The principles of secrecy and surveillance in their different forms are operative in the academy. Knowledge on the island is dependent on a strict hierarchy of tasks and of access. This is apparent from the beginning because some pieces of information are only imparted by the appropriate characters. But it is even more clearly outlined in the presentation of the House of Solomon, where each and every individual is found at a specific place in the scientific hierarchical order. Set of them connect knowledge, others think out new experiments, others still carry them out, and so on. Where at the top of the hierarchy, the interpreters of nature are the most dignified philosophers, corresponding to Bacon's ideal for the place of philosophy. It is therefore under these stringent conditions that the center of the island, Solomon's house, can grow and prosper. It is because of secrecy and surveillance that science can develop. Cooperation between science and surveillance might be crucial to the advancement of learning, seems, uh, Bacon seems to suggest. The House of Solomon itself, in its inner organization and functioning, bear these marks. First, the landscape described by the priest appears bucolic enough, with its lakes and ponds, spacious houses, baths, orchards, and gardens. But all around, high towers and the text indicates that they are half a mile in height, which is about the height of the current tallest building in the world somewhere in Gaul. These high towers give structure to the whole landscape. They're further placed on high hills, suggesting that they control the landscape. Among the very many operations which can be carried out in this academy, um, beyond the dispensary, sorry, which remind us of the importance of medicine for bacon, Become beyond the mechanical arts, which are crucial to the advancement of natural philosophy, some have to do with vision. The setup boasts perspective houses where various types of optical instruments can be found, such as laser beam like concentrations of light, which the text says we carry to great distance and make so sharp as to discern small points and lines. Telescopes, which are means of seeing objects afar off, as in the heaven and remote places, helps with the sight far above spectacles and glasses in use, and magnifying glasses, which seem to announce the microscope. This emphasis on vision and on the mechanical aids to vision is compounded by the sound houses, where diverse experiments enable the circulation of sounds in unforeseen ways. The perception of sounds not usually audible, of course, and those of transforming the voice. The scientists' abilities also manifest in the house of deceit of the senses, where they experiment on perception but of which they do not make use because, as the text says, they hate all impostors and liars. At the heart of the academy, therefore, one encounters experiments and mechanical operations which project the scientist's power beyond the immediate perimeter of the island or simply of human beings. The science academy rests in part on systems of extreme observation while being able to control deceit, which ensures coherence and life of the system. This in turn suggests that the desirable mode for the construction of knowledge includes secrecy, hierarchy, and surveillance. In Bacon's blueprint, the organization of this ideal polity at all levels is not separable from modes of, from modes of control, neither in the functioning of the state nor in the structuring of knowledge. When considered from the perspective of control, as I've done today, rather than from the admittedly perhaps more Baconian angle of reflection on the conditions for the advancement of knowledge, the utopia advocated by the philosopher takes on slightly darker hues. But let us move to another island located in the same region. The trope of the island, so important for the development of narratives of utopia, as we know since Thomas More, is also essential for the novel, thereby suggesting perhaps links with the genre of the novel and the mode of utopia. This is something which I would like now to explore briefly through a consideration of the first Robinson Crusoe. 
The island enables, of course, as in Bacon's tale, the development of a thought experiment. But while Bacon's perspective is that of the organizing state, Defoe's focuses famously on the individual. The relationship between society, religion, and the individual is at the core of the novel. But equally important, as noted, for instance, by Rosina Salenso, are the constraints ex exercised on the experiment. The limitations are apparent in Crusoe's ignorance of the forces that drive him, in the authoritarian elements that surface to the construction of a generally liberal state, prompting Rosen and Salenso to describe the island as a perfect liberal surveillance state, in which the interactions between personhood, autonomy and surveillance are not fully resolved. While we may agree globally with this picture, I think uh, that the first novel opens up further issues. First one, um, perhaps most importantly, not noted by, um, by Rosen and Salenso, we need to remember that the first day on the island, while happening during the years of restoration back home, is made economically possible by the fact that while he's on the island, his fortune prospers because of his investments in Brazil. Slaves are all this while contributing, unbeknownst to him, of course, to his accumulating wealth. Specifically, the whole mental experiment of Robinson Crusoe is based on the, su on the success of colonialism and slavery which generates an income Crusoe is able to recover at the end of his period of isolation, and which will, of course, fund the, 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 the sequel of Robinson Crusoe. So that the experiment in the construction of personhood and society is in turn dependent on forms of oppression and exploitation, which entail further limits, but at another level, suggest a possible interpretation of the construction of the liberal state and self in the novel. Not unlike Bacon's New Atlantis, the island operates under the trope of observation. This starts with what is the first gesture of the castaway, the survey of the land, so as to organize an appropriate space and defend it against possible intrusions. My next work, says Robinson, was to view the country and seek a proper place for my habitation and where to stow my goods to secure them from whatever might happen. This trope of observation is apparent at every turn of Crusoe's wanderings on the island. There are about 150 occurrences of the verb see, to which must be added all verbs denoting similar operations, such as observe, spy, etc. The discovery of the footprint, one of the most famous pages in Western literature, is solely dependent on the senses. And here you have the quote on the handout, I think. I stood like one thunderstruck, all as if I had seen an apparition. I listened, I looked round me, I could hear nothing nor see anything. I could see no other impression but that one. I went to it again to see if there were any more and to observe if it might not be my fancy. This brings about in Robinson apprehensions of seeing a man and he's ready to sink into the ground at about the shadow of silent appearance of a man's having set foot in, in the eye. The silence which surrounds this quasi apparition elaborated in different ways through Brunel's soundtrack in the film throws into relief the visual shock of observing the footprint and suggests, ominously, a hidden presence, a concealed observer, a danger that lurks. This adds to Robinson's sense of isolation, which characterizes the first part of the book, where he finds himself so absolutely miserable, so without help abandoned, so entirely depressed. This feeling of isolation has two consequences. On the one hand, it brings about introspection on the part of Robinson. Now I looked upon my past life with such horror, he said at several stages, and contributes to the investigation of the self and the fashioning of personhood. On the other hand, isolation is conducive to building defenses and fortifications, erecting walls, and after the sighting of the footsteps, his abode becomes his castle, leading him to build a second fortification. So that the landscape is reshaped by Crusoe, not only because he domesticate, domesticates parts of it, but also because he structures it around the presence of the castle, to which he returns to seek safety at every opportunity. Both aspects, inner investigation and outer fortifications, are not necessarily unconnected, as suggested in John Bender's pioneering and work on the penitentiary. Indeed, above the text looms the figure of the prison through the narrative of confinement. The island, Crusoe says, was certainly a prison to me. The physical transformation of the country is supplemented by the political system which Robinson puts in place. Before any other encounter, Robinson surveys the land 
with a feeling of pleasure at finding himself the king and lord of all this country indefeasibly. And this expression may of course be a touch of irony on the part of Defoe, here, who as a dissenter would not necessarily have approved of such kings and lords. He finds himself with a right of possession. He calls himself variously Lord of the Manor, King or Emperor. And when the island starts being populated, he finds himself as absolute Lord and Lawgiver. So that in spite of some possible references to a Lockean state of nature and ensuring social contract, the language of polity remains, at least ambiguously so, that of autocracy in the Stuart mould. The presence in the text of the language of surveillance, if not in the tools and implements of surveillance, suggests that the possibilities of utopia opened up by Crusoe's isolation on the island are inseparable from control and power. They extend the ambiguities of the text caught between, on the one hand, the establishment of a liberal persona in a state which appears to be built along Lockean lines of social contract, and the presence of tropes and figures, such famously as the prison or fortifications, or again, absolute rule, which indicate the inscription of the supposed liberal state within an autocratic or authoritarian regime. Further, the reliance on colonialism and slavery as the economic condition of not only Crusoe's return to the world after his exile, but also the entire thought experiment suggests intricate ways in which Defoe's text is articulated to control dominance and power. This is perhaps best understood if one thinks briefly of the legacy of Robinson Crusoe, where the text gave birth, birth roughly to two distinct uh, types of interpretations and rewritings. The benevolent, optimistic, Lockean dimension of life on the island can be tracked through such texts as Swiss Family Robinson in the 19th century or Coral Island, which interpret the experience on the island as nurturing and formative. On the other hand, such texts as Wells' The Island of Dr. Morrow with its macabre scientific experiments, or Golding's Life, Lord of the Flies, which dissolves the Lockean social contract into a Hobbesian state of nature, enhanced with the dystopic portrayals of life on the island, tyranny, control, and surveillance. Texts like Defoe's or Bacon, therefore, while appearing to be blueprints for a better science or to investigate personhood and construction of the modern individual, reveal that such projects are inseparable from a darker side intricately linked with their utopian proposals. And it is precisely, as I will now suggest, the role of satire to bring out this darker side and to make it apparent to readers. As we know, the overarching metaphor of Gulliver's travels is one of containment. From the multitude of ligatures that tie Gulliver to the ground when he wakes up in Lilliput, to his being paraded in a box in Brobdingnag, to his willing captivity among the Grinnins, not to mention his choice of spending as much of his time in the stables with his horses at the end, Gulliver appears to be battered from one structure of control to another. While Gulliver is the arch intruder into various lands and polities, while he's the arch observer of distant lands and unknown countries, he's also the arch prisoner, finding that, perhaps with the exception of Wood Creek, he constantly needs to extricate himself from the power that is exerted on him by others. This builds in fascinating ways issues of surveillance into the text and the dystopian regime of some parts of the narrative adds to the complexity of his position and of the readers. As noted in a famous and beautiful essay by Pat Rogers, Gulliver's Glasses, Gulliver's favored mode of observation is, like Robinson, the eye. And the glasses which he keeps with him are crucial in this respect. Not only because in Bacon's words, there are helps for the sight, but also because they protect him from the volley of arrows thrown at him by the Blifascotians. And we remember that when Gulliver is condemned for treason by the Blifascians, they sentence him to put out both his eyes because it would be sufficient for him to see by the eyes of the ministers. Gulliver's glasses escape the attention of the Blifascians, as does his pocket perspective, the telescope, which Gulliver ironically mentions as being of no consequence to the emperor I did not think myself bad enough to discover. That eyes at sight and instruments to improve their capacity should be the object of negotiations and conflict underlies the importance of vision, not only in Lilliput, but also in Brockingham. They point to a world which is apprehended through the senses, but they also echo Swift's 
favoured use of mirrors and other amplifiers of vision in order to find satire. In Gulliver's pockets, as examined by the Lippushans, we encounter basic personal belongings, ranging from shaving tools to snuff, not forgetting his watch. Here I suggest we pause a little and consider how the Lilliputians refer to something they do not understand and make us perceive differently, something we carry about us every day and flashes on our computer screens, even as we are, no doubt, absorbed in the lecture. So the quote um, is the next one we hand out. Out of the right fob hung a great silver chain with a wonderful kind of engine at the bottom. We directed him to draw out whatever was at the end of that chain which appeared to be a globe, half silver, and half of some transparent metal. For on the transparent side, we saw certain strange figures, circularly drawn, and thought we could touch them, till we found our fingers, fingers stopped by the elusive substance. We put this engine into our ears, which made an incessant noise, like that of a water mill. And we conjecture it is either some unknown animal, or the god that he worships. But we're more inclined to the latter opinion because he assured us, we understood him right, for he expressed himself very imperfectly, that he seldom did anything without consulting. He called it his oracle and said it pointed out the time for every action of his life. But the fascinating process of defamiliarization induced by the Leopoldian's intrusion into the pockets brings about is not only a new perception of the watch, but mainly a satirical take on our relationship to objects. To time, which highlights the connection between time and what is timely, and to the world, and indeed our submission to these objects. Further, the investigation of the pockets of Gulliver inscribes at the heart of Swift's writing a questioning of our ability to observe and to understand what we observe, which we may indeed be analyzed in terms of a parody of a society based on empiricism. But in the total surveillance implemented by the little man lies also the potential defeat of such enterprises. Vision and exposure are also the heart of Gulliver's adventures in Brobdin now, as Gulliver, for fear of being trampled on by the giants at the beginning of Book Two, finds in the middle of a cornfield. But on being picked up by the farmer, and later on finding a place at the court of the king, he becomes literally an object of curiosity. He is observed, but also raged as an attraction, an activity, of course, not unfamiliar to 18th century uh, readers, where nat natives from distant lands or dwarves could be displayed in similar fashion. The ambivalence of vision is further explored through Gulliver's observing at close quarters the skin of the fine ladies of Brombingham or the vermin in the beggar's clothes. Because of the dangers which surround Gulliver and Brombingham, because of his sudden diminutive size, he is not to be kept out of sight. Which, sketch, which sketches once again the complex attractions of surveillance, both as protection and as control. This is further materialized in the box which is built for Gulliver, or rather two boxes, because he has one smaller in size, drop foot, for tracking. The box both shields him and displays him, both protects him and contains him, functions both as a space of seclusion and as a space of conflict. It is a prison but one from which he can emerge from time to time for fresh air. It constitutes, finally, his means of escape as he is scorched by an eagle and dropped into the sea. The satirical ambivalence of the relationship between seeing and controlling appears further, but in different ways, in Book 3. The empiricism of society adumbrated in the book is, of course, omnipresent in Book 3, and in particular in the Academy of Legado, which hosts a number of scientists variously engaged in absorbing experiments with matter. These scientists, more particularly, are intent on reversing the course of nature, returning cucumbers to sunbeams or excrements to nutrients, trying to turn hard matter into its opposite through the development of pillars made out of marble, aspiring to the ether of science and knowledge while being constantly caught up in matter. The organization of the academy echoes the House of Solomon proposed by Bacon, but why the House of Solomon rests on a tight system of hierarchical organization, which corresponds to steps in the advancement of science, if not in the progress of reasoning by, um, if not in progress of reasoning by induction, the garden is striking because of the impossibility 
to find a structure. Gulliver wanders from room to room, always observing another scientist, enumerating projectors rather than organizing them. Even the division between experimenters, speculative learning, mathematical school, and political projectors is without rationale and without pretense of an underlying logic. Bereft of logic, the garden displays a world from which collaboration between scientists in the Bacconi mold has disappeared, and the aimlessness of their individual tasks is all that remains of a world that was structured by the hierarchy of knowledge and the control exerted by the polity over science. The fact that such disorganization of science and society is to be encountered in the same voyage as the most violent form of coercion to be found in the text is directly relevant to the argument. The floating island which Gulliver investigates is a technological wonder which, thanks to a gigantic magnet, can rise and fall and move from one place to another. But it is precisely designed for a prince to bring under his obedience whatever country lay within the attraction of that magnet. This happens in two different ways. The first consists in hovering over the place to be subdued so that it is deprived of sun and rain, thus provoking droughts and diseases in the population. The second method, if insurrection persists, if insurrection persists, sorry, consists in letting the island drop directly upon their heads, which makes a universal destruction both of houses and of men. But this last option is was very seldom used, not only because it might be viewed adversely by the population, but also because there's a risk that the island might break on dropping over spies or rocks below. An example of such rebellion, successfully carried out, is given in a textual edition which alludes to the Irish rebellion, led by Swift, against the imposition of copper coinage on Ireland. The structure of the island embodies the forces of surveillance in the text, while providing stronger means of coercion and punishment. It brings together science, technology, surveillance, and containment. It punctures utopian aspirations, not only in the frightening device which is put forward, but also in the ultimate risks that the island might encounter, as well as in the episode of successful rebellion. Gulliver's fourth voyage carries the ambiguities of utopia and the modes of surveillance to a chilling extreme. Gulliver, in this last expedition, encounters utopia made flesh in a world which is governed solely by the reason of the wise horses, the Huynians. But the tension of the episode proceeds from the fact that, as we remember, the yahoos, which are despicable beings kept at bay by the winnings, embody a form of humanity. More precisely, in Swift's words to his friend Sheridan, I'm quoting, expect no more from man that such an animal is capable of. Gulliver is therefore caught between the aspiration to pure reason embodied literally in horses and the impossibility to discard his own humanity, which makes of him a yahoo. But the Huynians themselves are ambiguous beings, and the topic discussed at one of their assemblies, whether the Yahoos should be exterminated from the face of the earth, suggests yet again a darker side to reason. The Huynians, who, the Huynian, sorry, who argues in favor of extermination, highlights, among other things, that the Yahoos are not originally from the land. They are not aborigines in the language of the text. They are foreigners, as we would say today. But Gulliver's master offers another option following Gulliver's cue. And I'm quoting here from, and you have the quote in the hand, on the handout. Among other things, I mentioned a custom we had of castrating beings when they were young, in order to render them tame, that the operation was easy and safe, that it was no shame to learn wisdom from brutes, that this invention might be practiced upon the younger Yahoos here, which besides rendering, rendering them tractable and fitter for use, would in an age put an end to the whole species without destroying life. So that the utopian land for which Gulliver feels love and veneration is exposed through satire as a darker world where control, submission, physical harm are the organizing principles while potentially offering destruction and eradication of the species, ironically, without destroying life. Swift's treatment of the possibilities of utopia is therefore undermined by satire which carries to their logical conclusion the principles on which such utopias rest. As noted by J.H. Pearl, Gulliver travels, and satire travels with him, seeming to doom utopia wherever he sets foot. In Swift's Gulliver's travels, utopia can no longer exist, and Gulliver can no longer inhabit them. The satirical stance 
brings out the language and leader modes of surveillance in the distant lands, in the descriptions of Gulliver's home, England, in the revisiting of forms of utopia, in focusing on vision as both a favored means of investigation of the world and as a definition of the satirical position, Swift ties in the modes of surveillance of utopia and of satire. In doing this, he's also placing readers in the position of Gulliver, who, <clears throat> readers who relate to Gulliver's predicament while necessarily seeking the distance, itself an illusion. The only utopias, therefore, that are left are utopias of the mind. I'm quoting Gulliver one last time, my memory and imaginations were perpetually filled with the virtues and ideas of those exalted women, my memory and imaginations. How much time do you have left, guys? Because I can't hear you, I'll take it a yeah, yeah, yeah. Five, five to ten minutes. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, so in, in another and, and perhaps better world, I would have devoted more time to Pope's great satirical poem, The Dunciad. But the world being what it is, and five or ten minutes left, I would just pass a few brief comments on Pope's poem, um, and perhaps that would serve as a pretense of a conclusion. Uh, the Dunciad, as we know, is placed within the larger ancient and modern quarrels and forensically examines uh, the project of the moderns to take over the cultural world uh, of Britain and of the ancients. The poem proceeds from a series of quarrels which involve Pope and a number of writers. Famously, first Theobald, an editor of Shakespeare who had antagonized Pope in the first version of the Dunciad, and Colle Sibber, the poet laureate who replaces Theobald in the second uh, version of the Dunciad of 1742. The argument of the poem is also linked to the larger issue of bad taste, having conquered the literary world. It is, in Pope's words, I forgot to uh, print this quote, the introduction of those diversions of the rabble in Smithfield to be the entertainment of the court and town. Or in other words, the action, the action of the Dunciad is a removal of the imperial seat of dullness from the city to the polite world, as that of the Enid is the removal of the empire of Troy to Latin. Dullness in Pope's world has taken over the polite world, and the poem presents the consequences of, the, of such progress. In book two in particular, the dancers take over, street by street, the city of London. And you will note in the first quote from Pope on your handout, that we get a very precise geography of, of the city. Richard Blackmore, who was a, a physician and indifferent uh, but prolific poet, wins a noise-making contest, contest, and his cry can be heard to roll down the streets. If Dodden feels the brethren with amaze, prick all their ears up and forget to graze. Long Chancery Lane, retentive, rolls the sound, and calls to courts return it round and round. Tames wafts it thence to Rufus drawing hall, and Hungerford re echoes for the ball. The world is being reshaped, refashioned, conquered by dullness, and we follow its progress through the city of London. Because the nobility and the king give patronage to such dancers, the world stands on the brink of collapse. Pope's point is both poetic and political. The parody of the epic turns the contemporary world into a dystopian empire, increasingly so, uh, with the progress of the rule of the god of dullness until her final triumph. While the politics of the age are satirically displayed as favoring this empire. The text articulates a literary opposition, for the Sibber's plural talent as viewed by Pope, and a political context, Sibber as poet laureate. It examines the state of the Republic, it examines the state of the Republic of Letters, characterized by quarrels, skirmishes, and fragmentation, and relates it to the political environment, the corruption of politics under Walpole. It constructs a world, the world of London, which is being taken over by the forces of darkness, where surveillance dominates the world and true science and letters can no longer flourish. The goddess's empire appears in no uncertain words as one people with sycophants who are dutifully rewarded, who embody the collapse in values and ambassadors by Pope. The next quote, I won't read the first four lines, but then a motley mixture in long wigs and bags, in silks and crepes and garters and in rags, from drawing rooms, from colleges, from garrets, on horse, on foot, in hacks and gilded chariots, all who true dancers in her cause appeared and all who knew those dancers to reward.
But it is with book four of the last edition of the Danciad that the satire is bitter and the dystopian uh, world is extremely bleak. There the queen, and this is the next quote, she mounts the throne, her head a cloud concealed, and a few lines below, beneath her footstool, signs, groans, and chains, and which dreads exile, penalties and pains. There foam rebellious logic, gagged and bound, there strict fair rhetoric languished on the ground. The despotic power of Donitz has subdued all the classical disciplines, science as much as rhetoric. Book four parades its dunces with Collis Sibber, the antichrist of wit, as the arch dunce, but it is dullness who reigns supreme and whose restoration is the subject of book four. All dunces are ultimately made in her image. There are, of course, here echoes of the Christian God, but what Pope was addressing and lamenting in his satire was the fact that poor writers and incompetent poets had taken over the world of letters. For Pope, the world was in danger. The moderns were overthrowing the ancients. The dunces were taking power. Above all, the values in which he and his friends, such as Swift, believed were being undermined and in danger of collapse. Pope's response is to give us in the Danciad a view of the world taken over by darkness, where dark darkness reigns supreme. By extolling Sibba, by asserting the triumph of dullness and the demise of truth, philosophy, science, religion, and morality, by the absence of vision of the final line of a poem, Pope shows that, that the forces of destruction can and have indeed conquered the world, and the principles of anti disputation have triumphed. It's my last quote, the last few lines of the poem. Nor public fame, nor private, dares to shine. Nor human spark is left, nor glimpse divine. Lo, thy dread empire, chaos, is restored. Light dies before thine creating world. Thy hand, great honour, lets the curtain fall, and universal darkness, there is all. The severity of state, reigns supreme. I therefore try to suggest that what these texts offer is not, of course, a fully fledged critique of surveillance, nor do they wish to do so. What they bring to light in these incurred forms of surveillance is the embeddedness of the language and practice of surveillance in thinking about the world, and in particular about its future. Bacon thought that technological advancement was indeed a prerequisite for all advancement of knowledge, suggesting a few hundred years before our own technological age that the nature of innovation and knowledge production positions surveillance as a modality, perhaps even as a condition, of technical and social progress. The fur implied that not only the construction of the modern subject and of liberal polity had to face issues of control and dominance, but perhaps that the whole project was itself dependent on colonialism and slavery as modes of economic sustainability and multiplication of riches. Swift's satire enabled us to perceive that the contradictions faced by utopian projects could be exposed and as insurmountable, leading the reader to reflect on a world without narrative in book three, or one where each open desire is necessarily thwarted. Pope's great poem, finally, sees the defeat of arts and science under the armies of dullness as the dystopian future of Britain. But where Bacon and Defoe looked forward to the developments of science and the progress of society, Swift and Pope showed through satire the doomed prospects of such hopes. Gulliver's willing journey to the borders of animality or the progress of dullness finally restored to her throne, emphasize the risk we incur in surrendering ourselves to forces without resistance. For both Swift and Pope, perhaps for all satirists, this resist resistance is to be found in words first, in satirical practice, and eventually in laughter. As Pope says, I'm quoting our author in his very laughter, is not indulging his own ill nature, but only punishing that of others. Both Swift and Pope ultimately rely on the reader's forces of resistance prompted in no uncertain ways by laughter. Thank you. Well, you know, if, if in, in, a, in a good world, we would have rounds of applause at this point, and I, I think I should have set up a recording, a, and maybe even a laugh track would have, would have been helpful for, for that. Yes, as they do on the BBC. I, I, I'm going to try and remember that for next time. I'll, I'll, I'll set up some, some applause and some laugh tracks. So, so I think you're going to have to take those things as read, and uh, let me just say how much uh, certainly I enjoyed it, and I'm sure that everybody here uh, enjoyed that. It was really terrific and, and great to have those quotes on the handout that we could refer to when you were, when you were um, reading from them too. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'm inviting people at this point to um, uh, send, me, send me their questions or uh, post the questions on the, the chat or the Q&A line. 
Um, but perhaps I could just um, kick it off while people sort of um, think about what you've been talking about with, I suppose, an observation and then, then a question. Um, so the observation is just a way of enforcing, I think, or extending what you were saying. I, my own, I'm not very familiar with 18th century literature, but I um, know a little bit about Thomas More's Utopia. And I think that a lot of those things that you were saying about the connection between utopia and utopia, certainly in Moore's case, um, presents a very morally static world, a world of rigid social structures. And, and, and that sort of stasis is always under threat, right? So, so it, it, it's perhaps in the nature of utopias, even if we go back to more uh, two centuries earlier than, than the time that you're looking at, it's in the nature of utopia to be both static because it's perfect and therefore has nowhere to move and therefore fragile and full of anxiety and the, and and this leads to kind of cultures of surveillance as to try and maintain that um, moral universe in in its perfect form and i'm i'm wondering whether it's our in the modern world too it's both our dreams of utopia and our sense of fragility of, of the world, of the utopian world, which is part of the driving forces um, and the kind of movements to um, surveillance, control and protection, as you say. So, so that's kind of my, my observation. And then I think my question is really about how this connects to satire. And I'm, and I'm just wondering whether it's one of the powers of satire in relation to surveillance is if, if we think of surveillance as fundamentally a kind of an external observation of something or someone from the outside and then trying to sort of read what is happening, you know, you in front of the computer or in a, in a public place with the CCTV cameras there looking at you from the outside. And the power of satire is that it works through an, a, a largely internal set of references, and therefore it's often quite opaque to systems of surveillance. It, it, it's a kind of an inbuilt form of resistance because it creates systems of codes and decodes that are very hard to crack to people who are not within that, um, not within that society, right? So it creates these kind of, yeah, codes of critique that actually turn the anxiety or, or the paranoia of the surveillance forces back on themselves. Um, thank you very much. It's fascinating um, comments. First one, um, just a word about you, your observation and about the, the, the sort of tension that Utopia since more has found itself under that kind of, as you're saying, sort of rigid immobility and, and the sort of the threat uh, of movement. Um, we see the first side of it in Bacon's direct take on, on more in some in some sense mm. in the New Atlantis. Um, but and and what what I was trying to suggest and, and which you, you express much better is indeed, for example, with Swift and, and perhaps also with Pope, that whole thing is thrown open. That that what uh, Swift does is precisely disrupts completely that stasis through the satirical thing and shows just the bits and pieces that lie uh, scattered rather than the the, the overall con construction or the impossibility to remain in that uh, overall static construction. Your, your second question about, um, or your question about um, satire as being opaque because of its systems of, of codes and, and, uh, and, and, and um, you know, decoding, etc. Uh, it's very interesting because it, 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 um, it can enable us to make sense of Pope's dancia because so Dunciad went through three different stages. The first one was just a satirical poem attacking various dancers and in particular Theobald who to sort of um, uh, talk about Shakespeare and talk about Pope's Shakespeare in, in very unkind words and therefore Pope was very angry. Um, but then uh, a year later, um, uh, Pope prepared uh, another edition of the Dunciad, Barriorum uh, Dunciad with footnotes explaining who were the people that he was talking about. And in, interesting, in an interesting sort of uh, exchange of letters between Pope and Swift, Swift actually encouraged Pope to do this because he said, yeah, and this was in 1728, so 
in, 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 the, in the heat of the arguments when everybody knew about this, he said, we need footnotes because not everybody knows the people you're talking about. And all these people will disappear from view. So, so Pope proceeded to do this. And in the 1742 edition, the footnotes and the paraphernalia and the whole sort of, um, uh, you know, critical tools and notes, etc., are actually longer than the poem itself. So that there is indeed the object becomes, as you're, you're suggesting, I think it's fascinating, itself the resistance to that order uh, which is threatening to take over, to that uh, control which is threatening uh, to, to, um, to, to exert itself on, on the world of on the British Republic of Letters, at least. In fact, if I could just sort of um, uh, say one more thing about that, as you spoke there, I suddenly think, yes, of course, is it, isn't it partly because of the rise of a culture of censorship in 18th century English law that, that these writers turn to satire? And my recollection is that, in fact, some really interesting cases in the legal system in the 18th century with people trying to work out whether what was said or not said about a fictitious king you know, is actually treasonous, you know. So there's a case where somebody says this is treasonous because the, the king as being weak and cowardly and then they say, what, it's a fictional character? Are you suggesting that you read this fictional character as being about our real noble king? It's you that are actually treasonous, it's not us at all. And they get caught up in this whole the cycle of reference become actually self-defeating in some ways, and so so it's 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 part of the it's part of the legal product of the time, isn't it? That that we have the kind of the rise of satire as a coded response to growing censorship regimes, which then create this whole jurisprudence about censorship. No, yeah, absolutely, and and the further element that that you add to this is the um, the, the, the issue of anonymity. Um, Swift, for example, used all these personae to publish his texts and. In particular, one thinks of the campaign he launched against um, uh, the English government for the introduction of the copper coinage in Ireland through the publication of the Draper's Letters, which are sort of famously letters written by a Draper uh, uh, from the city of Dublin, who in his own you know, language of sort of shopkeeper uh, answers, uh, uh, answers, you know, replies to, to whatever, it, it responds to whatever is happening. And, and of course, everybody knew it was Swift, but he still became sort of identified with that persona. And then, sort of, you know, of course, with Gulliver, you know, Gulliver's Travels published as being by Gulliver, etc. So I think it ties in very well with what you're suggesting about um, cultural censorship and the issue of anonymity, even when there is no anonymity. Right. I mean, there's this this lovely double double game, isn't there, between what everybody knows and what nobody says. Mm -hmm. that, yes. that is at the heart of both surveillance and satire. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anne, uh, I've got a couple of people on, on my question list, so I'm going to go to Anne first. Hello. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Zadji, for um, a much needed perspective to end the present conference. Um, I not so much that I have a question as I have a comment and I think that there is something clearly that you pointed out in your um, talk that it was missing from the uh, way in which we considered or envisaged the, the conference and um, over the last few weeks. Um, what I was particularly interested was the way in which you um, considered surveillance in the positive way um, both as being uh, one of the tools of production of knowledge and the way in which it contributed to the building of um, the, the building of uh, identities um, and um, both perspectives of course um, are to be um, read in Foucault's analysis of, of you know, surveillance too. But I do think that um, we tend to be completely glued into um, a critical um, um, outlook on perspective and a negative way of in considering surveillance. And we forget about the way in which we are actually shaped by that same surveillance. Yes, yeah, so because it's not a question, I will not give you an answer, but uh, I think that the, um, uh, you're right, it's that shaping, the ways we're shaped that needs, I think, investigation that, that you know, that the literary text can do. Uh, 
And this is what I find particularly fascinating in Defoe, for example, uh, the ways in which, uh, you know, we, we've all come to agree that, you know, uh, Robinson Crusoe is this fantastic, you know, um, thought experiment that details the conditions for its with, um, construction of society, construction of the individual, construction of the political system. But there are still ambiguities there. There's still sort of things that resist. There's still sort of constraints on the uh, thought experiment. So we, we, we're forced at, you know, to, to constantly make our understanding of these shaping forces and the nature of the ways in which uh, we, we, we operate. Uh, we're forced, I think, to, to, to bring back some complexity into, into the matter. That's, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Yelena, you, you wanted to come in uh, and ask a question. I did, and Des, you sort of stole half of my uh, comment question. Um, us both being <laughs> lawyers, we always think of how the law has intervened here. Um, of course, uh, you mentioned the centuries in which this, um, in which the literature which you discussed, Alexis, was written, but I think the implications that Des touched upon in terms of censorship as well as surveillance in the context of satire have been particularly pertinent um, in modern Europe and in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, and especially in respect of the French law, uh, French laws which uh, limit freedom of expression in the context of comedy and specifically satire. So there's a string of European court decisions which have said, um, even though freedom of expression is legally protected, it's part of this norm that liberates individuals that ensures the state does not surveil too much on how people communicate and also achieve all those other restrictive effects that we've long acknowledged. We're going to give the state a margin of appreciation so that uh, punishments for satire that had uh, implications in terms of bigotry and racism and all of those other nasty effects were fine. They, they were permissible under the European framework. And I wonder whether it's not just limited to um, upheavals centuries ago, this powerful effect of satire, but also the equally strong reaction of a populace through the law, through the state, um, in response to the challenges that satirical uh, literature, satirical discourse might make. And maybe there's a growing trend of restriction, even of satire and comedy today, when we don't have the same sorts of upheavals as we had centuries ago, where we might think we're more comfortable with the limits of freedom of expression that we have today, and uh, where we think we might be more prepared to have people look at what we say, how we behave, how we communicate with each other. So that was just my comment that I think um, that's not something that we can limit to centuries ago, this tension between satire and restriction and what the permissible limits of satire are. And even our perception of those permissible limits might um, be a return to the incursions that occurred centuries ago. I don't know whether you have a comment on on the applicability of these um, uh, implications today in the modern uh, world. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. And, and of course, um, this is something we're painfully reminded of in France at the moment, because there's the, um, the trial about the Charlier uh, killings that's sort of happening at, at, at the moment. So. Um, Another, another uh, example uh, that you might think of is the Satanic Versus uh, affair, which was, um, in the way you, you, you frame it, exactly about that and about various components. It's about, I, and it's interesting because of course it's a literary, you know, it's a novel that I think, uh, irrespective of, the, of, the, um, of what happened, is heavily indebted to the satirical tradition. And, um, and the, some of the elements which you used to mention in years with um, sketching of the interaction between, uh, between different, you know, between the law, uh, the populace, uh, restrictions, freedom of expression are directly relevant, I think, to the satanic versus affair, where, where after all, um, you know, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, was a fatwa, which is a legal pronouncement. Um, the populace took over 
as you know, with you know all the sort of uh, demonstrations, burning of effigies, um, killing of translators, etc., uh, etc., uh, etc., et uh, leading to restrictions where in certain countries like um, like the UK, for example, the scanning glasses were not readily available. In India, it was completely banned. Uh, um, in France, the publisher had to be uh, to, to, to live under police protection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so there is absolutely, you're absolutely right, a kind of um, enduring history of um, they take fraught relationships between satire, the law, and you're absolutely right, the populace, which is something very important for, for the wider public. Well, um, I'm, has anyone else got a question? Any more questions to ask at this point? I think, um, you know, it, did you want to, a closing remark from, from you to say? Uh, um, just to you, say thank you. Well, um, <laughs> because um, I, I know how difficult it must have been watching television for the last 45 minutes or one hour. Um, and, and I want to thank you for your patience. Oh, no, I, I mean, I, I found it, I'm sure everybody online found it immensely uh, stimulating. It really, you know, provoked a lot of different thoughts. And actually, I could, you know, could happily ch chat on for another half an hour and talk about colonialism and satire, for example, which is another really interesting Absolutely. kind of question. My, my only worry is that you can't go for a drink now. No, it was so, so this is a good point to stop. We are well past six. This is the end of our season. I want to thank everybody who's participated, including those, everyone here today and those who may be listening to it later if they couldn't make this event. Thank you, everybody, for, for making it happen. Thanks in particular to Professor Tadier for a wonderful conclusion to the, to the season. And as you say, I think now is the time for all of us in Australia to go and have a glass of wine and, uh, and a nice evening. And for those of you in France, I think it's probably time for... Uh, a uh, bol de café au lait and a bon journée uh, uh, à tous over there. Um, so uh, thank you all. And uh, my appreciation for all of the work and effort and care that's gone into this. Thank you, thank you very much.